A very warm welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Michelle de Klerk, and I'm the founder of the Women's Chapter. And today we are running a very, very special event with Gita Sidhu Rob, who is the founder of Nosh Detox, but also a leadership coach. And she has developed a really interesting talk called Lead Like a Woman, which we've just been, before this event started, chatting through some of the key points that she's going to be covering today. And it's really, really exciting. Gita, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you here with us this oh morning. Oh my God, I'm so grateful that you had me on, Michelle. I love your, your community. Thank you. And I always find our conversations so high energy. I come out of them with a spring in my step. So this is exactly what I need this morning, but hopefully what some of the other people who've joined us today are feeling as well. Um, I dare you to not have a spring in your step after this event. So Gita, I think it would be good to start off with, for those that might not know you, um, to talk a little bit about your journey and how you've come to be where you are now. Gosh, I'm so old, it's a really long story, so we'll cut it really now. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm from Africa. I'm a Malawian who came out to this country, um, uh, you know, at some stage, 15, 16, 15. And um, being Indian, I had a few choices growing up, doctor, lawyer, accountant, death, marriage. And so I picked lawyer because, and I say it every time, and my mother doesn't laugh. She didn't laugh because that's exactly what it was. I was like, oh my God. So I became a lawyer. And then my first child was very, very ill. He was allergic to a protein in an injection they gave him. So we then spent the next 18 months in the hospital. Yeah. He, he actually died. He had cardiorespiratory arrest, spent time in a coma, had to be resuscitated. And my life was never the same. So I went down the route of how do I keep him alive? Because he, kept, he, you know, he was anaphylactic at that stage. And I think these crises, they kind of, I've always called them turning left because you kind of are going like this and suddenly life goes like this. And, I, and so I was like, you know what? Actually, my mother was like, she get married again because, you know, girls alone and it's easier. And I was like, he needs siblings because, you know, I'm just going to end up making him the center of my life. And that's bad for his health. So I married this man had two more children with him and ended up in a really violently abusive alcoholic marriage. And I didn't understand those things because we aren't really a family that drank. And I, you know, I just, I don't even know. It's a way of saying I was very naive, which is okay. I was very young. I was allowed to be naive. And um, I lasted in that marriage for a while. And it was just horrible because my son wasn't his child. So it was all about, well, my children can, you know, like, and it was just horrendous. And the police used to be called and they kept saying, why don't you leave him? And I'm like, I can't afford to leave him. I don't know where to go. I haven't got anywhere, you know, because we made all our money together, but he, I used to let him manage the money because that's how I was brought up. And, you know, he knew how to manage the money. So he managed it and, and, and I helped him. We both made the money and he would bring in the deal. I would land the deal. That's what we did. We made millions, millions, millions of pounds in a very short period of time, in about five years. Had my house in Monaco. I had my Ferrari. I had two Ferraris just because people who, he just liked buying cars. I had my own plane, which I really miss. I miss having an airplane. I just want to tell you people I really miss that. But yeah. Um, and I walked out. I woke up, woke up one morning and I was like, I can't do this. Um, and I walked out with <laughs> my one-year-old, my nappies. My seven-year-old was holding the three-year-old's hand. And um, my mother said, you're an idiot. Go back. And when I refused, she locked the door and left town of her house. Um, and um, everybody just was like, no, this is the wrong thing to do. You're so wealthy, why would you leave? And I was just like, how is that the denominator? So I had a, I stayed in a, the, my next door neighbor, I spent the night in her house because I literally didn't know where to go. Because I thought my mother would take me and she wouldn't. Um, and then a girlfriend said, I've got a room. So I spent the next, Oh, and he, he emptied all our bank accounts, took all our money away. He um, bankrupted me. I had 200 pounds and I'd never, you know, you just, all oh, my job left. Lo I lost everything, right? Um, and there's not much call for bankrupt corporate lawyers. And I tell you all this because it's really important to understand that there are places in life, no matter with what privilege you're brought up with, I was brought up extremely wealthy, very well off and very highly educated and very privileged. And that when you don't do as a woman what you're supposed to do, 
you know, you get punished for it. You do get punished for it. And that's what happened to me. And so I ended up sleeping in a friend's house and the, the, the kid slept on the bed. The baby was on a little mat thing on the floor because she was little. And I had cushions, sofa cushions on the floor and I slept on the sofa cushions. I, like I said, I still miss my plane, but you know, hey, it's all relative. <laughs> so I did that for six months and then a company offered me a job and they, I made getting a house lease as part of that job. And then that's the only way we, I moved into my own bedroom. Wow. Yeah, it's really good to know this shit, huh? Because I'll never ever not be emotional telling this story because it was so painful. And I will never ever stop telling this story because I had a contract with the BBC when I first started. And they were like, after this, because I was trying to make money to eat, right? And they, they said, this guy said, you've got to talk about this. And I said, I don't want to, I feel ashamed and guilty. I feel like it was my fault. And he said, if someone who looks like you doesn't say these things, nobody will believe it happens to people. Like They think it's their fault. I want you to know it wasn't your fault. And uh, yeah, because if it was, it was mine. And it definitely was not my fault. So they, there are a few things that have really resonated for me out of what you've said. Um, one of them, you know, was what career choices were available to you and what that expectation was for you as a, as a woman growing up in a certain way. Um, it was very much the same for me. I wanted to, I wanted to go a creative route and my dad said, no, you go to university and you get a degree and you go into the business world and then you can do whatever you want afterwards kind of thing. Right. So, Just get the thing and then you can do what you want because they think by that stage you won't be able to. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And in, and in the process you would, you would meet a rich guy. Right. And, and because um, <laughs> that was your job. Yeah. And I mean, I was fortunate my dad did regard me as smart. So, you know, yes, he, I was too. encouraged to go to university and I was the first person in our family, despite kind of being a very new money family, um, mm -hmm. going to university, which was quite a big deal. But um, but the other thing that you were talking about was also this this idea that, you know, around leaving and why would you leave? Because there is this expectation. And I think it still exists today that if you make your bed, you lie, lie in it. In it. Yeah. And I mean, when, when you were saying that I could hear that in my, in, you know, in my mind, it's the kind of thing my grandparents would have said. It's the kind of thing my grandparents said to my mother. Um, so I think so many of us do suffer from that, that stigma around kind of you making shall... a big change where you compromise the future of your children, where it's almost better devil, letting, letting down devil your family. Know. Yeah. And better, better the devil, you know, than the one you don't. Right. So I, 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 your story is really inspiring. And I mean, the level of courage and how deep you had to dig to make and What's worse is that everyone hated me. It's really interesting. That didn't clock. I didn't clock that till about four years ago, but everyone hated me. That's what made it so hard. My mother was furious because you know, what the hell? My father was really unwell at this stage. Otherwise he would have saved me and protected me. Mm. My mother was just angry and left frigging town. My, um, my father then died in this process and she took all of my inheritance as well, because if I got it, I would have used it badly, you know, to like provide for me and my children. Mm. <laughs> and so there was that. And then it was what would society say? So then everybody wanted me to go live in a council flat somewhere and I didn't know where it was and it wasn't close to the kids' schools and everything. Um, and so they hated me because I wasn't, and then my friends hated me because I had left my husband and they hated their husbands and they were like, what the hell are you doing leaving yours? And so they stopped talking to me. So I also lost all my friends mm. immediately as well. And because you smell, you literally start to smell. Well, and not only happen. Not only that, I don't know if you experienced this, but there's this really strange thing that happens when you uh, get divorced or you separate, that you stop getting invited to things. To anything. You don't get invited. And funny enough, I was chatting to another Women's Chapter member about this exact thing at our member meetup last month. She was saying it's the, she's going to write a book about it, um, about how you just don't get invitations anymore. Not Well, certainly not to couple things. Um, but yeah, so you you land up being kind of a social outcast in that sense, despite you having left a really bad situation. So it's, yeah. And I nobody's mean, sympathetic because no. there was so much money. Nobody's sympathetic because they were like, well, you chose to leave. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell us, how did you come to found Nosh Detox, which for those that might not know, was the first cold press juice company and delivery company in the UK. Yes. But and how in did 2007, you go from 2008. couch surfing with your kids <laughs> to founding your juice company? 
Well, because poverty is just a great energizer, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of like we had to eat and I didn't know how to provide food. I didn't know what to do. And my friend was already giving us a room. I didn't want to now go and eat her food. Her husband was very unhappy about us being there. And she was just like, God bless the woman. She was like, I am not leaving her on the street. I'm just not doing it. And he was he hated it. You know, <clears throat> um, I mean, he let us stay good, but he hated it. So I was like, well, I can't go and eat your food and I, I don't know how to do school fees and everything. Um, and my ex-husband, bless him forever, said to me, because my children were in the private school around the corner. And he said, and I couldn't work, I had to pay fees because I had no money and he had taken it all, right? So I remember him coming one day, going, you know, if you would just come back, I'll take care of it all. Wow. And I remember thinking I was so lucky I didn't have a knife because I would have killed him. I was this rush of utter fury that you brought me to my knees and you think that because I'm on my knees, I will now come back. And then my mother would ring in intermittently going, I don't know that any man will take three children, you know, cause like they just don't like that other people's children, but you're good looking enough to find someone to look after you. And I was like, oh my God, what the actual fuck, you know? And, and it's really, I, and I say these things because Finding a man to look after you is condoned by society. Finding a rich man to look after you is an achievement. Mm. And so why was I not doing an achieving thing when I was able to do it? And there was a queue of them, right? And I was just like, no. And it was so hard, Michelle, to say no. It was so hard to say no, because it was easy. And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do this, what do we do? <clears throat> so I did a couple of years as a corporate negotiator. People, if there was a problem, people would ring me. I'd fly to Belarus, I'd fly somewhere and I'd Rwanda and I'd fix the problem and I'd come back. It was like the pursuit of happiness. I literally, I watched that film and I couldn't, I had to walk out because it was my life. I just couldn't bear it. It was exactly how I lived. And um, so I did that for a while because I had to keep coming back because my son would die or get sick or literally end up in a coma or something. I was like, okay, I just have to work from home. And I have to sit at home and I have to do, and it's not like people were beating down the door to give me a work. I was bankrupt, right? Um, and I don't know if you've ever been bankrupt, but you fall off the edge of the world. Like your bank accounts get taken away. You can't get cards. You can't get leases. You can't do anything. And people were so kind to me. My bank manager was just lovely. He, I remember going in to tell him what had happened. He said, stop talking. I was like, okay. And he gave me this piece of paper and he said, signed this piece of paper. And he said, don't talk. And he went away and he came back. He said, oh, it was so nice. You opened your new bank account, which I transferred all your money into. What did you want to say to me? I was like, a bankrupt? And he went, oh, I'll have to close that bank, that old account down. And he closed the old account down so I could access the money in the new one. Wow. I mean, like he just didn't have to do that, you know? Mm. Um, or he did some version. I was busy being traumatized. I've no idea. He did some version of that anyway. So he froze all my old accounts, but they didn't have any money in them. So nobody cared. So I did all this and I would get paid to do it because I had to find school fees and I had to find food and I had to, you know, do whatever. And I was flying to Saudi Arabia and I was like, oh, it was terrible. So my daughter said to me the other day, she was like, I used to stand at the window and cry till I couldn't see you anymore. And I'm just like, oh my God, you know, and what do you do? So I was like, okay, I need to set up a business where I build something where I'm at home. And the only thing I knew how to do was people's bodies because I had healed my son of eczema, asthma, anaphylaxis, and I'd made him strong and I'd done this. And that was what I knew how to do. And I'm like, he cannot be the only person that lives like this. And he said something which was so interesting. I was holding him and we were looking in the fridge because I was like, okay, okay, no, 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 it's fine, sweetie. And then I was looking in the fridge for something. I can't remember. And he said, mama, I can't eat anything in this fridge. I literally cannot because I will die if I eat anything in this fridge. And I had these things just, oh, they still made me cry. And um, I was like, I'll make food that everybody can eat that tastes good. So that when you go somewhere and they would do all these school go, you know, day I was away and things like that. So yeah. I started to make food for everyone and bless the school. They were like, okay. And the other parents, they would buy all this food and I started to feed the kids. And then from feeding the kids, people would come and go, oh, my God, we have allergies or we want this because it was healthy food. And I didn't know it was healthy food because this is how, you know, you're an African. We eat really well, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I was delivering food to companies for lunches and things. And then I ended up, I was driving back from Coca-Cola because I just delivered a corporate lunch and I'd made thousands of pounds. And I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't want to be delivering lunch to Coca-Cola. I really hate this. And my mother was being very rude about me being went from a lawyer to a caterer. And it really, she wasn't being positive about it. But I also just wasn't enjoying it. So I thought I'm going to set up a business where I deliver allergy free food to adults because there are so many of them. This is what I'm going to do. 
So I decided to do that on the, I, I closed down the, the, the catering business on the 1st of December, uh, which now I thought I should have sold though. And then I said on the 6th of January, I'm going to open up another business. And I found the chef on the 4th of January. I found the delivery driver on the 5th of January. I mean, it was like, but you know, when it's meant to happen. And then I set up Nosh Detox and we started uh, gluten, dairy, egg and nut-free food delivery in 2007. So we delivered that and I did it for one year to see if it would work. And it did work. So I gave up all my other work. And in 2008, that's what I did. 2008, we delivered the first juices to anyone, juice fast. They didn't exist. So we delivered those. Mm -hmm. 2012, we went into supermarkets. 2013, we had the first retail IVs. And that's how the business grew. And then Gwyneth Paltrow um, said to Vogue, the best detox I've ever done is Nosh Detox. And I think she said that in 2009. Or 10 and we just blew up um and it was phenomenal and so it put my kids through school um yeah it's been really good to me and now you have another string to your bow because <clears throat> you have gone on and trained as a leadership coach and i know you do a lot of nutritional work as well um which sets you up really nicely to help women like all of us with not only the leadership challenges from a coaching perspective, running a business, driving a career, but also thinking about how we're balancing that, you know, from a self-care perspective as well. Yeah, so I used to have a lot of really, really, I mean, you know this, because I used to have a lot of very famous coaching clients, like household names. Um, and it's really different coaching household names because they're a very particular kind of person. They're not the same at all as you and I. And you have to be, you know, and they would come in the door going, fix me. And because I'm like, oh, because like that's the circuit you get into when one recommends you, they all come. And it's lovely and it's nice, but it's not the same as working with kind of you and me type thing. So when the pandemic came, I was, I trained myself as a coach. I trained as a gut health specialist, as a hormone health specialist. And then when the pandemic came, uh, everything just blew up, right? Like, like my drip clinic business went to zero in four days. And, you know, we were, it was, we were turning over nearly seven figures on just that alone. And it went literally to zero in four days. And then, you know, the food delivery was like, well, we can still deliver, but people didn't want drivers in their homes. Do you remember there was this thing mm -hmm. of who are, you, who are you letting in and do you wash, the, you know, all this stuff. And so everything, we did not flourish in lockdown at all. And I was like, well, I don't know what we're going to do. So we spoke to like 1,500 women on our database. We have a really big database. And we rang them and we just spent time just calling them going, what do you need? What do you need? And the one thing everybody said was they were stressed as crap and they were getting fat as hell and it was really hurting them. And so we developed a program for stress fat because it's that fat that you can't get rid of by dieting. What you have to do is manage the stress behind it to lose weight. And once you manage the stress, you actually manage to lose weight because you're managing the way you live. Yeah. And then this kind of, and it was so much fun. I mean, absolutely love my life. It's just the best way to make a living. And then that evolved over that year because a lot of what I did is I just, my job was to be a mother and an entrepreneur. Nobody actually cared if I was happy because neither did I, that wasn't my job. You know, but there were things that were the price you paid for what you were doing kind of thing. And I didn't really pay attention. And then, um, yeah, so that, that's how I developed the coaching skills and, and the coaching arena that I now occupy, which is I still do the kind of high end coaching stuff. And, you know, I had like the Duchess of York just became a client of mine. And the, you know, the, I've got CEOs of, of big, big like Fidelity's FinCap, those people. And then I've got women like you and me. Um, so both, th there's always both levels now, which is more fun, basically. I'm a, I'm a celebrity in my own mind, Peter. Yeah, babe, me too. <laughs> like, even if no one cares, we, we are. But you're not my client, right? So now if you became my client, we could be talking about this. <laughs> so one of the things that um, we were speaking about before the call that I know you wanted to talk about was this evolution of, of, of women and our kind of power, I guess, as we get older. What are your thoughts on that? Because obviously so, you've worked with lots of different women of all different ages. Um, and we were sort of talking about the whole midlife, perimenopause, this age that a lot of women are moving into. Um, but can you tell us a bit more about this evolution of power as we age? 
hundred percent. Yeah, because it's my absolute favorite topic, and I could talk about it till we were all dying and blue in the face. So the thing is that um, there's two strands to this. The first strand is that my client base tends to be women from thirty-five to forty onwards, and the first strand of this is that we have we're very control addictive as women especially in the way that we live these days, right? And so we spend a lot of our lives just controlling, 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 either controlling our homes or our lives or our hair or our this or that. And you can control any part of your body. You can go and get your face completely changed. You can go and get your body changed. You can go and get everything changed. And so we become very addicted to it. And then when we hit our perimenopausal years, which is 35 to 40, um, life starts to take a completely different view and it all just blows up. And you start going, what on earth? earth is happening to me i am still working out i am doing everything i've always done like i love intermittent fasting i just would i wouldn't eat till i hated like breakfast and i wouldn't start eating till 12 o'clock and then i would kind of eat you know in a packed pit and then stop eating again worked brilliantly i don't think i've ever been bigger than a size eight with great joy and never wanted to be smaller never wanted never had to think about it and then you you tell women this and around 40 42 44 women are like she's 45 they're like, uh, what did you say? I remember you saying something. What, what, you know, and there's this thing because your body just changes and you do all the same shit and you suddenly start to put on weight and you suddenly start to, there are signs that come up and you start to lose your hair and your nails don't grow. Your skin gets really dry. Your sleep gets really bad. Your digestion screws up and you're kind of like, oh my God, what on earth is going on? And what's happening is two things here. Literally, what we've learned is that we work in the life cycle of a perimenopausal woman, right? Because um, we, you at this stage are going through perimenopause. It lasts three to 11 years and you have to give up control because you have no more control over your body. None. Now, because you cannot control perimenopause and it's driving you mad, what can you control? And so that was what I had developed when I was having the leadership conversation, because at this stage, you have to rethink how you eat, who you are, what you're doing, how you're going to do it. And what's the way to say this? The way to say it is this. Perimenopause is inevitable. Stress is optional. So that. you're always going to have perimenopause. There's no getting around from it. The way to manage the process is to manage the stress that you live with. So let me put a couple of caveats here. When I tell someone, let me help you manage it, like someone said to you, let me help you manage your stress. I'd be like, give me a break. I've got three children. I'm a single parent. I run a business. I'm a semi-public figure. And I, what are you talking about managing my stress? Which would you like me to give up? Sell one of the children? You know, it becomes those conversations. That I'm like, uh, no, but so I started to look at this. I went to visit, I got COVID and my, my, my body went boom into menopause in a way this year that I didn't even understand. And I put on weight and I did, and I was just like, oh my God, what, you know, what? so I, I, every time something happens to me or my clients, I try and systemize it and find a solution for it. And my best friend got uh, made the ambassador to the Netherlands. And it's a big deal. And I'm super happy because she has a car and a flag and I get to be in the car with a flag, which is all I care about. I'm like, you do the work, babe. I'll be in the car. I'll be sleeping in that car. And she's just like, idiot. But she moves like an hour away from me, which I'm so happy. Or oh, two hours. How far is the hemp Holland? Whatever. A couple of hours. So I'm super happy about that. Um, and we worked out that the biggest problem was that we're brought up to be good girls. Mm -hmm. Now, being a good girl and being a leader, I'm not actually mutually compatible on any level. So can I take you down this journey of what I found out? So I was on the plane and um, I was coming back from, from visiting her because she's friggin' eight and a half hours away, sadly, and she's coming closer. And I was listening to this man called Mo Gawadat and he was the head of Google X. And he said that he got made the head of Google X when he was 29. So he was at the pinnacle of his success and he was unhappy miserable 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 and his son then died when he was 21 right and he said it just made me go off on a journey of understanding what on earth life's about and so the guy said to him what do you think is the secret what's your biggest failure so this man's talking it's the most amazing you should watch the video it's diary of a ceo with mo Gauda. and the last five minutes he said what do you consider to be your biggest failure and he said, my biggest failure is that I did not embrace the feminine side of my being, because actually yeah. leadership 
should be more feminine. The world should be more feminine. We are doing a disservice to women by forcing them to act like men, by forcing them to be in a position where they have to be competitive, have to be masculine, have to do all this. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. Me, you, plus everybody I freaking know, and every woman who is my client, because she's an achieving, ambitious woman over the age of freaking 40, we're stuck in this pit of doing this stuff. I remember being a lawyer and we bought female cufflinks. The female cufflink, it's pink. Right, but we behaved and we dressed like men. Oh, because we were lawyers, we couldn't do anything else. So he said that when you look at people like Steve Jobs and Gandhi, their biggest successes came from their feminine sides. That when Steve Jobs made Apple something that was beautiful, he was appealing to our feminine sides. And that's why he was so successful. And that when he became a man again, and he was obstreperous and rude and difficult, that's when he was most unsuccessful. Gandhi picked flow and nurture, and that flow and nurture was his femininity. He said, so the mass feminization of the leadership in the world is what humanity needs, because leaders should be, not do. I was like, bro, give me a pulpit and let me talk about this. So what this is, is this. We have certain truisms as women. Number one, we think we must do more than we must be. Number two, we think it's very important and more important to be liked than to be trusted and respected. And number three, we think success has a price. And that price, which we pay daily, is actually paid by our bodies. Now, those are the three things that I narrowed it down to. Now, if you look at success as a price paid by our bodies, this is where you know you do things you don't know why. The reason I ran NOSH for 10 years, 12 years, was because I could come here and speak with authority about this. So do you remember that your mother grew her own hair, grew her own nails? And today we have to get extensions and we have to get fake nails in order to have those nails. Well, I mean, I don't, but this is what I do for a living, right? But we, we look at it. So <clears throat> if you look at leadership qualifications, right? The, World Economic Forum, the Center of Creative Leadership and everything, they have like eight to 10 uh, requirements, eight requirements for leadership. And of those eight requirements for leadership, six of them are feminine, six. So what do we do as society? Because we're so screwed up. We hire male CEOs and we spend millions teaching them how to think like a woman. Literally millions. I know because I get paid to teach these guys to think like a woman. We teach them team building. Have you ever needed to tell a woman that? We teach them how to communicate. Like you guys, you're, you're all listening in the chat. If you want to say, did anyone, any woman here ever need to be taught how to communicate? Right? Did you ever have to be taught how to be empathic? Never. But if you're a guy, you have to be taught how to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So in fact, what I'm saying is that women are naturally leaders and good leaders. We found this in the pandemic, right? In the pandemic, it was the women leaders that actually ran the pandemics better for their countries than the male leaders do. So why do we not act and step into our power as women in order to be the right type of leaders? It comes down to when you are growing up as a woman, <clears throat> as a girl, Number one, an intelligent woman was never felt safe as an intelligent girl. No young girl ever grew up with somebody going, I love how intelligent you are, sweetie, do it more. Hmm? Did you instead get told, you don't have to talk so much? No, no, darling, don't, 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 don't tell the boys you beat them all the time. I have a client who literally says she's from Tanzania. She literally said to me that she used to have to hide her results from her brothers because her grades were so much better than them. Wow. So intelligent women naturally don't feel safe as they grow up because their intelligence was not celebrated when they were young. And the other thing is, that, so that's one thing. Number two, you look around you as a young girl, who had the most power, the men or the women? Mm. growing up who around you made more money the men or the women growing up who around you ran the countries ran everything made decisions was stronger could hurt you could really make differences in your life could ruin the trajectory of your life was it men or women mm, yeah certainly a lack of female role models 
So what did you do? Did you grow up thinking, I'm just going to be my most feminine because it's really powerful? Uh, no. You thought, do you know what, mate? You stay feminine over there. I'm going to head in this direction because I'm going to act like him because that's my route to success, power, freedom, control. So then what happened was this. You turned up and you took your feminine body with your vagina, because I don't understand tampax and their stupid ideas about who's a woman and who's not a woman, vagina, and you said, I'm going to behave like this man, because that's how you do it. The trouble with it is, is let me give you this as an analogy. How many of you have ever moved to live in a different country? Okay. And when you moved to that different country, did you find you put on weight? Did you find you were really stressed? Did you find you really struggled until you adapted? Yes. So when you're a Japanese coming to live in Germany, you have to learn the German customs, the way Germans eat, the way Germans work. You feel you don't fit in, imposter syndrome, not understanding. It's because we're constantly trying to behave like men. Because that therein lies freedom, therein lies success, therein lies everything. And it's very, very, very hard. In fact, my Japanese client who did go work in Germany, I told him to tell everybody in his frigging department, thousands of people, they all had to speak English. Level the playing field. Mm. Right? So we pay a price for this behavior. And I didn't understand this till we started all the stress teaching through lockdown. And then I realized that 90% of the stress comes from not understanding what it means like to be a strong, powerful woman. And the other thing with this is that we don't really get there till around 40. Because until 40, we're busy. We're having babies. We're setting up houses. We're doing marriages. We're doing this, trying to get established at work. But when you get past, and of course, I'm making a number up. When you get past a certain threshold, you start to have more space and voice and power and success. Mm. then you start to fight your inner responses because being a good girl was what you got rewarded for what's the definition of a good girl smile look nice you should have nice long hair sweetie don't cut it short it's just not nice you need to be thin you should be groomed remember yep. all this shit mm -hmm. you got rewarded for that what did you get punished for i fucked everybody in town you're a slut what did you get punished for? I have an opinion. How dare you? I'm super intelligent. I beat all the boys. Oh, you're weird. You're a geek. We don't like you. No one will date you. Right? So we got rewarded for this stupidity, weaknesses, and we got punished for individuality. Whereas men got rewarded for sleeping around, having an opinion, being intelligent, being dominant. Whereas we're a bitch, obviously. Right? And they get punished for, don't cry, darling. Boys don't cry. No, 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 no. Are you a sissy? Do you remember those conversations? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the good girl piece for me is, is really resonates. And I think you're so, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's almost as you get older that you become more aware of that. Um, and it was actually through a women's chapter conversation that I sort of put my finger on from thinking there are these rules, supposed rules about what it means to be a good girl or what yeah. it means to be a successful woman, but who made up the rules? Society, city. because if the society didn't make up those rules, the problem you then have is that so much of what happens in society is supported by women being underrated under rewarded and, and underrepresented. Yeah. And if we weren't underrated, under rewarded and underrepresented, society would not function in this way. Who the hell is gonna sit at home and look after the kids and not get paid to do it? Well, it's your job. Yeah, yeah. But I, it was actually, it was Britta Fernandez Schmidt who uh, at the time was the their director for Women for Women International. Um, she's now gone on her and she wrote a book called uh, Fears to Fierce. And, and she speaks a lot about this kind of good girl perception and how she also, you know, she had this realization around all of the rules that had been imposed upon her as she was growing up and these perceptions that she had of what it meant to be a woman in a leadership role. They were all rules that were made up by men. Yeah. And then supported by women. 
to be fair. Oh, like yeah, the yeah. Mic, this is why I always talk about my mother. And I hope my mother never listens to one of my talks because <laughs> she she's, you know, we're we're now friendly, but but supported by women. Because it is how many women do you know? Let me put this out there for a moment. How many women do you know? Go, oh, I love to help women. I'm just here to help. That one is the one who's going to stab you in the back. Because mm. the ones that are actually helping women does not need to come out and tell you all this stuff. Yeah. So it's the men may have made up the rules, but the women, it's the women that will take for the, you know female gender mutilation it's the women that take you there to be cut wow yeah um but no i i love i love this idea of challenging you know the the good girl persona and who 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 is a good girl who's who made up the rules and if you break them what really will happen so that's what i thought i should do because i actually looked at all this and i remember that the choice is that i was very lucky because although I was brought up to be a very good girl, the thing that would override that instinct was looking after my children. So I always say that I was incredibly lucky that I had to provide for my kids. I would never have tried to provide the same life for me. But for my children, I had certain things I was never going to give up. They were always going to go to private school. How dare you? They were always this. They were always this. And I wanted to live where I lived, even though it's a very expensive part of town. I was like, I'll live in a shoebox, but I'll live here because this is where my kids know their friends. And you know what it's like when you move to another country and you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have that, that linking to people who knew you when you were children and it hurts. And I wanted my kids to have that, you know? Mm -hmm. I wanted them to feel safe. And so I absolutely got to a place where I was like, I'm gonna do this my way. And I always say people hated me, but when I am where I am now, I'm an incredibly powerful woman. And I really like that about myself. And the more powerful I have gotten, the softer, calmer, more feminine, less brash I have. I was the person that would stand on something and yell. And I don't anymore. I stand on the thing and I speak, I'm still speaking truths, but you know, more softly, more gently. It takes a minute for your brain to work out what I've said instead of me yelling and shoving it down your throat. Now I'm like, please feel welcome because my power is mine. Yeah. But what I want is you to have your power and to wear it every single day, all the time. And so do you have a piece of advice <clears throat> on how those that have joined us today could start to unlock that, harness it? Apart from working with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Um, you know, the way that we function is that we function as, as an amalgam of mind, of body, mind, and spirit. We function. I don't mind what words you use and what language you use, but that's who we are. And we're those tears. And the thing to understand is that you cannot, if you have, but, but the way I describe it is this, you have one container. You are all one container. Like I am one container. How I feel about my hair, how I feel about my brain, how I feel about my body, how I feel about where I'm going, what I'm doing, whether I'm lovable, not love, all those things are in one container. You cannot expect success and hating your body. You just can't expect that. It doesn't work. And I know this because when I work with women and I take those emotions and fears out, they soar. And they were like, but, but, but I'm the same, but you're not the same person. When you hate yourself, even a small part of you, you cannot fly and succeed. You cannot, right? And so the, bit, the benefits, so let's bring this back into a circle. This is the thing, for example, like perimenopause. It teaches you to understand your body. You cannot manage perimenopause unless you manage cortisol. You cannot. When you manage cortisol, perimenopause is 100% more manageable. You're still going to be uncomfortable, like this, the National Menopause Society of North America, there's a hell of a name, did a study last year. And they said that um, they reduced hot flushes by 84% by one cup of edamame beans a day. Half a cup, half a cup of edamame beans a day. Now, hot flushes ruin your frigging life. They literally are impossible. You can't sleep. You feel like you're dying, da, 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 da. So what we're saying is let's go back to your body, give your body what it needs, and then your body will support your mind and it will support your spirit. Because then you get to the stage also at a certain age, you're like, but why am I here? What am I doing? What's my purpose? Why, what, how do I have impact? How do I give more? How do I be more? How do I find my voice? Mm. You cannot do that if you hate who you are. Right? So don't, don't underestimate. Well, because I've done this for so long. We worked with, you know, I've said this before. We worked with dying cancer patients for three and a half years. 
four, five, six people would come in the door every frigging week who had a month left to live. Mm. And you're, you really change how you function with people when you're dealing with dying people. Because you're like, how do I get boom to the problem and manage this process? Yesterday, a lady rang who has endometrial cancer. And she's like, this guy's given me six months to live. What do I do? And I was like, what did you eat yesterday? And she said, I ate a grilled cheese, pasta with butter, and a bowl of ramen. I'm like, okay, can, can we talk about that? And she's like, but I want to know what to do. And I was like, yeah, you know, so, so what I do is I, I, I teach you to feed and water your body and your mind and your spirit. Because if you don't feed and water all parts of it, you're not, what is power? It's alignment, it's strength, right? You can have a very small lever, but when it's applied to the right place, it shifts a whole huge thing. And for us as women, that sense of alignment, that sense of knowing who we are, is the biggest power you're ever gonna have. I know myself now and I accept and love who I am and that's what my power comes from. Yeah, and I, acceptance is such an important part of that. Radical it? acceptance. Um, and unfortunately mm -hmm. is, it is often something that only comes with age and experience where you do start to question all of these, these things that you were so hard on yourself about and you realize, you know, like, why did I do that? Um, I mean, if you were just speaking about body image, you know, and I think so, you know, everybody suffers from this in some way or another, um, where you, I used to hear my mother say things like this, oh, I wish I had worn the bikini. I wish I'd worn the jeans. I wish I'd done, but there are all these kind of crippling insecurities and, and, and ideas that we build around. Answer the doorbell, so, I'm really sorry. Oh, you God. keep talking. I'm coming back in one second. <laughs> um, yeah, that I think reaching that point of acceptance of all the things and just being less hard on yourself um, is a really important part of, of owning your power and starting to feel more comfortable in your own skin physically and how that then translates from an emotional perspective into your work life. Um, I think at this stage, it would be really good to encourage if anyone's got any questions, please pop them into the chat because the idea is that this is interactive um, and it's not just about Gita and I chatting. Although I Unless we sent you to sleep, of course. <laughs> yeah, but could keep having this conversation for ages. Um, one of the other questions that I had for you, Gita, you mentioned at the start of this before we were sort of having our prelim chat about Maslow's hierarchy of needs which I think all of us have heard of or know something about um, and how you have recreated that. That's to it's be because I really hate, for yeah, women. It, yeah, <laughs> I've womanized, feminized Maslow's freaking hierarchy. The number of times like, I tell Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I was like, I'll just go read them. You know, because like, actually what is, do you know that his psychological, physiological needs, the core needs, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean reproduction? So basically what he means was sex because it was 1940 something that he created it. And that's what, shut up. Do you know what I mean? Like my core physiological need is actually almost, I'll give up air, water and food if the kids are fine. And, and, and sex is not on that agenda at all. So I recreated anyway, a female version of it. And so <laughs> I called it Gita's hierarchy of needs. Um, and so I said, the first, it, we start with external needs as women, right? So the needs are, what do I need so I can work, right? And that need is, oh, how are the kids? How's my home? Here's whatever I'm doing. Because so many of us now are breadwinners and we're the ones looking after our families. So it's like, what environment do we need so that we can work? The next need then becomes is, what do I need so I can be more effective? And so what you're doing there is you're kind of honing what you did in terms of what you're doing in terms of work. I, in order to be more effective, I have to work out, I have to do this, I have to do that. But when we get to that stage, we think we're looking after ourselves, but we're really not, because those are still needs that are being met for the people outside of me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make myself better so I can help them. I'm not making myself better so it helps me. So then you hit the concept of actually what is leadership and you don't become an effective leader till you head on to the next layers. So the next step is having a dream or having hope, you know, because actually as a woman having a dream and a hope, it's very unusual. 
we don't often have them because they're so work related, they're so family related, they're so related to what we're doing for others that having a dream and a hope is, is, is allowing hope to come from inside you. And that becomes the internal journey and that's where it starts. And that is the need. You've got to have a dream and hope because if as a woman you don't have that, there is a really, it's, it's miserable. Then the next one becomes, can I have more? What more can I have? Me, for me. And then that's a need you've got to look at. It's a need you've got to fulfill. Because if you can't ask, can I have more? You're not, you're not opening yourself up to anything else. Then what else is it that you need? What else? Where are you going to get it from? And the one after that then becomes, well, how do I get self-esteem, self-trust, and self-love? So to me, those are the needs. Then those last three or four are internal needs, and the first two are external. They're like kind of Maslow's hierarchy. They're all external kind of needs and for us we have them but only in the first two layers after that it's an internal growth process that we need as women and mostly we have space to do it in the perimenopausal time i have a question around you know the that need to do things for us um and it'll be really interesting to know your thoughts on this um the idea that we should model happiness for ourselves and become happiness role models by making choices around what is good for us um, and modeling that for our children, for our employees, for our colleagues. Um, because I think that's another really difficult thing for women to do because it goes against that kind of nurture instinct that we have to do things for others before doing things for ourselves but actually like in you your whole journey and and making that decision to leave your marriage that was you were essentially making difficult decisions in order to ultimately role model happiness for your children you were giving them permission to make those same difficult decisions one day for themselves if they have to in order to be happier safer stronger um that sounds really sweet, but actually I thought he would hurt my son. I didn't leave till I thought he would hurt my son. And my, he was six foot four. And I just was like, his hand was like this big. Mm. Can you imagine? So like just, and my son's face was, and I just remember thinking, God, he might kill him. Mm. And that's, I, 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 you know, let's keep it real. That is not at all true yeah. for them. Yeah. I left because I thought he would hurt my son. Now, and, and see, I don't want to model happiness. I don't. I've never... I don't even talk about happiness. I but don't maybe want to you model do. Happiness. I think you do it without realizing it. Yes, I want to model power because the more powerful I feel, mm -hmm. the happier I am. Yeah. And there are days I'm not happy, and I'm like, "Give me a packet of crisps, shut up, and let me get back under my duvet." <laughs> but then that's what I need for my happiness, right then. Mm. Right. And yeah. then there's like I, I'm I'm um, uh, chair of the Montessori Foundation and of you know Microloan Foundation, which helps women in Africa and. And I do both of those and they make me happy. I don't get paid to do them. They make me happy, but they come because I'm powerful because they need me to help them with their strategy and their whatever, and they don't pay me, but I get the benefit. So I don't ever want to model happiness. I think that's a massive responsibility and I, I don't want to model that, but I will model power. I'll model choice. I'll model, not even control because control is brittle. I'll model self-acceptance, self-esteem. Mm. Mm. self-trust let me model that happily yeah. and yeah. can can you see how relaxing that is yeah absolutely but i i think ultimately the way that you would look and come across to other people when yeah. you are modeling all of those things is you would come across as content you would come across as calm in control happy happy yeah that's you know, a really that's great like, question michelle i like in, it in as that, an idea yeah just in that place in that flow where you are um you you're you're ahead of your 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 saboteurs the things that stand in the way of you feeling good about yourself but i think so many of us underestimate that all of those processes come from doing things for ourselves well and next and, and really i think primarily as women it's to identify ourselves because when i was bringing up the kids and going through this journey that i talked about today I was going through it and I had really covered me as an entrepreneur. I had covered me as a mother. There was nowhere I covered me as a woman. 
And I remember getting really sick one day and the nurse going, we've got to put you on a drip and me crying my eyes out because it was two o'clock and I had to go to the nursery to pick up the kids at 3.15. And she's like, you can't. I'm like, I can't not. There is no one else. And I remember sitting there thinking, if I die, then my ex-husband and my mother get to look after my kids. And from that moment on, I looked after my own body as a priority. It's the most money I spend will be on looking after myself. Yeah. for me that I spent yeah. I'm like I'd rather do that than a handbag in a frigging day you yeah. know um but so so yes I, I hadn't thought of it like that so yeah I think you model that probably because I am so much happier than I have ever been mm-hmm. and I look back at the at what I've done and I think there are so many frigging sort of tragedies in there and I don't see them as that because I sometimes tell my story and I'm like god I sound like a complete twat having gone through all those things and, and they feel like they happen to someone else. And I'm a bit embarrassed sometimes. And then I think, you know, but then That's this resilience, which is another word I really hurt, hate a lot. I hate resilience, honestly, because I feel like women are taught to be resilient. And then you become like that trampoline for life. You'll always be resilient. You'll get through anything. No one ever tells a man that. I don't want to be <laughs> fucking resilient. I want to be strong and powerful. Yeah. Again, it's it's that thing that for me, power takes that space. Like some people go, oh, you're so confident. And you know me, I'm a raging introvert. Put me on a stage, TV and whatever, I'm super happy. But I really, really, I'm a bit worried about walking into a room full of people. Um, but I don't understand confidence, but I understand power. Mm. Because confidence you can fake. How do you fake power? Well, I, I don't think you can. And I think another, and it would be interesting to know whether or not you agree with this, but I'm a firm believer in we all have power it exists within us nobody gives it to you Um, and that's why I've always had a problem with the word empowerment because that suggests that somebody's transferring it to you Um, we all have it inside of us and it's our responsibility to nurture it grow it feed it um, develop it by focusing on you know building that little flame I I often I uh, I speak to my kids about this and I and we've spoken about this kind of that little fire that you have inside of you or that little that little voice that you have in your head that tells you you can do it yes Um, like a quiet calm confidence and I try to explain to them that that's that's what that's what your power is you know you just and you need to keep that positive self-talk going and reminding yourself um, that you have it it's the flame. I, I like that, Michelle. I like, um, but I, I always enjoy speaking to you because you always have a different view that you've thought out about the things that you're talking about. And I think that that's really important because a lot of this is a process of thinking from here to here to here. And then mm. once you've thought that process, do you agree? Do you not agree? Do you agree? Do you not agree? Do you agree? Do you not agree? Mm. So which ones do you keep and take and which ones do you not? Right. Yeah. And a hundred percent, every one of us is, I mean, is incredibly powerful. Right. If you can look at us and I grew up where I was supposed to be kind of pretty married and educated and I'm here today, then anyone can mm-hmm. friggin do it. Honestly. Right. Mm-hmm. Anyone can do it. Um, and usually like women will come to me as clients because they're struggling with that. They're struggling with how do I manage to be this person? How do I do this? Um, I had a very famous woman come in and her family set up the business that had her name in it, last name in it. And she, um, she, they wouldn't let her on the board because she was the only girl child and all the cousins. There were four brothers and their grandfather had set the thing up and they wouldn't let her on the board. And she came and she said, I'm sick. I'm like, you're not sick. You're fucking angry. She goes, no, 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 I'm sick. I'm like, you're furious. You're not sick. You know, so we're having that conversation. Mm. Um, and she she actually it took us nine months to get her strong and powerful enough to demand her space on the board. And now she has really scary files on everybody on that board. And ain't no one messing with her ever again. That's like a whole new level. That's nothing to do with what I'm teaching. But, you know, it's really important to find someone in your corner. And I think that's kind of what I do probably as, as, as when I show up every day as a coach, I'm like, you need someone in your corner who call you when you're doing it, but who will stand with you against anything. Mm. I have a client in the city now who's being thrown out of the company she built and we're having conversations every day, but it's pure misogyny. She just runs a business with a lot of men and she's kind of like, well, they're just screwing me. And it's like, yeah, and that sometimes happens. Now, how do you be the person that can manage to get through that space? 
How do you be that person? That's what, you know what? Nothing bad is never going to happen again. Of course it's going to happen. But what are you going to do and how fast can you pivot and recover from it? That's what power gives you. Mm. So I don't want you to call it resilience. Anyone here ever again, please don't call (laughs) it resilience. No, what the hell does resilience mean? It means I will overcome, I'll endure. Screw that shit. (laughs) No, 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 no. Yeah, well, for me, it's the bounce back. I mean, but it's interesting because you've challenged my perception of now by talking about the trampoline. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely think, I think power is at the heart or the core of all of it. Um, And as women, my, and as a woman, my biggest learning has been that I didn't need anybody's permission to utilize it. You see what I'm saying? And if you do need it, let me give it to you now. I give you free permission to be as powerful. Let me tell you, there is a place where standing in your power makes you 100% undismissible. Women come to me and they're like, oh, I've just taken Warner Brothers. Like their new marketing manager is three foot four. She's so cute, but she's like literally a midget. She's tiny, which is not three foot four, she's like five foot one. She goes, Gita, help me. I'm talking to a room full of men, all of whom were twice my size and I can't make them hear me. And it's like, babe, I defy you to ignore me anywhere anywhere Mm -hmm. but because i don't ignore me and michelle this is what you've done you don't ignore you either but if i don't ignore me you it's impossible honestly what i think of me is the only thing that matters what you think of me is with all politeness none of my damn business (laughs) it's just none of my business well because it's something that you can't control and why do you care and, th- and that's the, the other thing that I think a lot of us have learned, even if we haven't quite put our fingers on it over COVID, was, you know, you mentioned uh, your story about being on the drip. And I think a lot of us have realized over the last two and a half years, if we don't have our health and we don't look after ourselves, we are no good to anybody else. One container. And the other side of that is that also you have to, from a, for sanity, for stress management, we we've got to get better at just focusing on the things we can control and, and, and influencing those rather than worrying about everything else. And I think if all of us had to sit down and write down all the things that are worrying us and divide them into columns of what we can actually control and what we can't, it, it would be a massive revelation around, you know, what you can then do about it. Um, I agree. And, 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 and I, I have like a caveat there. I tell you, when I'm coaching, the first thing I teach women is how to show up in their most feminine self. Mm-hmm. And they don't always know how to do that. And they don't understand they're not doing that. So control, not control. Yes. If I made a list of everything I couldn't control, my heart starts to thump a little bit. Um, but if I can show up in my strongest place, mm-hmm then I don't need to make that list. Then I know what I'm doing. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's just, I agree with you. And there's, there's just a slight emotional shift I'd want to make around that, which is that the first thing I'm always saying is let's get you to a place where you understand what being a woman means. Mm -hmm. And, and you've, you know, we've hung out with, we're both intensely feminine women. And yet we stand in power. I am very, and yet yeah, we've stand, we stood in next to women who's, who's got their boobs right out and, and they're wearing low cut tops, which power to you, I wish I had boobs to do that with, but that is not femininity because femininity is used as a weapon to manipulate others. And it leaves us with a bad taste in our mouth. And what you wanna do is get to a place where the femininity and how you wear it is a sense of your absolute internal power. Wow. And it's Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know that Yasmina asked a question about what your most recommended books, videos, and resources are. And we are at time, but I wonder if those are, do you have anything like that on your website that I might be able to include a link in the follow up so that. Um, yeah. So I won't put it here. I'll give it to you and you can send it out. Okay. That, that would be amazing. Oh, yeah, um, I mean, I can put it here if you want me to, but otherwise okay. I'll put it there. Yeah. But, I mean, if you, if you, if anyone, if you've got time um, to pop them in the chat, that would be really helpful. But then I can also. So there's, and I'll send it to you as well. So that's the one where you can have access to the portal. And then there's, um, just to have a conversation with me, is bookgita.com. Amazing. That's so good. Yeah. And everyone who's been with us today, thank you so much. 
I hope that um, you have left with a different perspective or you've challenged your own perceptions, um, which I know every time I have a conversation with you, Gita, I do that and I'm better for it every single time. So thank I you. I completely so love you. Much. That's mutual. And I think that's one of the most important parts. I think for somebody me has a question about female networks is um well and, and networks in general is surrounding yourself with people who you can be real with but who also give you frank honest feedback challenge you challenge you to think about things in a different way because that's how we learn and we grow so thank you very much for being in my community oh um, such a pleasure <laughs> honestly love you completely and I just don't don't spend a lot of time thinking how many people I like because honestly that's just not how life works but you're very high on that list oh bless you thank you so much and thank you so much to everyone for joining us um we've had another let me just see if there's another message here oh thank you um and I will send out a follow-up with the link to this recording as well as um calls to action to find Gita's resources and information and how to book a call with her if you would like to. And of course, to ask any further questions if you have them. Thank you so much. Thank you for much. joining us, everyone. Thank you for having me, Michelle. I'm so grateful. You're welcome. I'm very grateful that you shared so much of yourself and your knowledge and your time with us today. Incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right. Cheers, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye.